The Beavers back on the road this week for their toughest back-to-back -back yet. Fresh off a loss to sixth-ranked Washington, Oregon State heads to sunny Southern California to take on another top 25 team. Sam Darnold and the crew are sure to be hungry after their playoff hopes took a hit last week after a loss to Washington State. What will it take for Oregon State to pull off their first Pac-12 win of the year? That's ahead on a brand new edition of Talking Beavers. head to hostile territory to play in the legendary Coliseum this weekend. Back-to-back -back top 25 teams for Oregon State, who is still searching for a Pac-12 win. Welcome into Talking Beavers on our beautiful new set of animators, Lindsay Schnell, Evanson Bernard. Guys, what do you think? We're going to be here for it's now It's really on, fancy. So I feel it's extremely does, fancy. Does. We have the lovely cityscape behind us of Portland, so that's kind of exciting. So. Fun stuff, lots of good stuff coming for you here uh, throughout the year. So uh, Oregon State falling to Washington over the weekend, 42-7 to seven, uh, in their second conference game of the year. But it feels like that score doesn't necessarily tell the whole story because it seemed like that first half, I mean, the defense was playing awesome. Hey, it's like they go three sacks the first five games of the season, and then they get three sacks in one half. That yeah. was huge for them. Yeah, uh, they look good. Um, you know, seven zip is the uh, first half. Uh, they're flying around. They look like confident. Um, you saw some excitement out of those players, too, you know, just jumping up, yelling, screaming. It was good to see. I think the fans were very involved. You had the student section involved, and they were back first, uh, first week of camp on campus. So it was exciting, and then things definitely changed. You know, and I think that Jake Browning said afterward that you could tell Oregon State was coming off a bye week, that they did some stuff that they didn't anticipate defensively. But also, this is why Washington is a favorite to go to the college football playoff. They should play like they did in the second half. This obviously has been a very challenging start for the Beavers, one that we've talked about here that, again, a lot of people didn't anticipate. There was a lot of excitement, a lot of bowl hopes uh, for this team this year. Keeping it close to a team of this caliber, again, against the sixth ranked team in the country. I mean, that's gotta do something to kind of help them build on things I, moving forward. I think it does, but I did wanna ask Evanson something. You know, as we've referenced before, we talk a lot um, off camera, all of us, plus Jason, our Friday night analyst. And Ev, you said something about Beaver Nation really frustrated right now. And I'm yep. curious, what's different about this slow start compared to in the past? Uh, I think it's year three, you know, and it's been a while since we went to a bowl game, what, 2013, and, and I think Beaver Nation wants to see that. They want to be competitive, you know, they're watching other games too, right, and they're watching com competitive football on TV. And so I think that they're just kind of distraught from, you know, seeing, you know, what we expected, right? Um, you know, we have the talent, and I truly believe we have good talent, uh, and so I think they want to see it, you know, the success on the field, you know, besides just always talking about it, um, they want to see action. I've kind of wondered if, you know, we've given, we've praised the offense and, and, excuse me, the team so much for being willing to say, like, bull game or bust, but yep. now that looks not great. Yeah. Sure, sure. <laughs> there's, still, there's still time, you know. Yeah. We'll talk about that a little later in the show. Uh, we did also see the return of Thomas Tyner. He had been doing and he looked good. Yes. Interesting injury. Uh, here's what he had to say about his return. Um, it, it was fun for the most part, even though the game didn't uh, end like we wanted it to. It was, it was still fun uh, being able to get back in the swing of things and uh, be with the team. Is it still weird to you at all, Thomas, that you now play for the Beavers? Or are you totally used to it yet? Because I'm not sure the Duck fans are used to it yet. Uh, I'm, I'm, I'm used to it. Uh, like The guys have done a great job of welcoming me. You know, I've been here for a while now, but I just feel like I've been here for a while, and uh, I think that's part of being a senior. But I think it's a lot of uh, the guys making it a team atmosphere, and I just love it here. So. Did you feel like your old self on Saturday for a stretch? Yeah, I felt, I felt fresh. Um, I'm back to my, my playing weight at 225, and that's why I ended up in the season at Oregon. So uh, it's, it's pretty similar, I would say. In our Les Schwab quick fix, a look at his season so far. Tyner, of course, back from a hamstring injury. Beavers certainly needed him after some injuries to Ryan Null and Art Pierce in that Washington game. Finished with nine carries for 54 yards and the only score of the day. Uh, what do you think of Tyner? Well, obviously, Lindsay already said she thinks he looks good, but what impressed you? And, of course... Yeah. Whose real opinion we care about the running yeah, back? It's good to see um, the kid back. You know, you know he's obviously had to deal with a lot of injuries, and it's it's almost a success story even for the guys on the team now. It's 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 cool to see that hey, this guy came back and fought his way through, and it was 
you know, I think Beaver Nation, they finally got what they wanted, right? <laughs> Thomas Tanner got some carries, and uh, he looked good. Um, very uh, decisive on his moves, uh, you know, got in the end zone, obviously. But he ran the ball good and ran the ball hard. Yeah, McGiven talked afterward about, uh, talked this week about, you know, there was all this excitement going into this season about, oh, we're going to have this really deep stable of running backs, and then they can't get all of them healthy at the same time. And, you know, then we see that again in this game. We see that this week. Nall has been banged up quite a bit. But I think that it's good, huge for his confidence, you know, because I think that that was big for him, wondering if he could actually come back. And Ryan, I'll, I knew you were at practice this week. Sounds like he was in a walking boot, but Art Pierce is practicing. How do you feel like this running back crew is going to look? What are they going to look like this week? So here's weekend? my question. What is the point in playing Ryan Nall? I don't think there is one. Yeah. They're not going to beat USC. Like, I'm rare, really confident in saying that. And that's not a knock on Oregon State. That's about how good USC is and how tough they are to beat at home. So I think keep him out, get him healthy, fresh. I mean, yeah, you it tell gives me. The, it gives other running backs a chance to step up, right, to show how, you know, how much they're worth, too. And they're, and they're looking at this. They're, they're chopping their lips right now. They're like, all right, it's my time to shine. Um, you know, and we saw that Tyner could. That yeah, he could handle yeah. It. So Did you feel like he looked 100% to you? Yeah. One of the one things I did look uh, is how he finished his runs, if he was going to lower his shoulder, right, because he had shoulder issues. And I, I saw a couple plays, and he lowered the boom on a couple times. Even on that touchdown run, he drops the shoulders. And so it's good to see the confidence right there because those shoulder injuries, that's a tough thing to come back and, and, and run effectively and use that to your advantage because most of that you kind of shy away from it a little bit. And you do some, they call it the business moves. You kind of, you know, <laughs> kind of, you kind of slide a little bit. <laughs> but it was good to see that. And those two running backs are going to fight it out. The USC, him and uh, Pierce are going to, you know, it's going to be good to see those two guys kind of going at it. All right, time now for our Wilson Motor Game Balls. And Evanson, we'll start with you. Uh, Nick Perebski, I loved it, man. Uh, definitely helped the defense out a lot. Uh, Washington has uh, some really long drives. Um, and I think it was, it was a good, and a lot of that was in the first half, too. So uh, I think he had a great game. Uh, and, you know, obviously the team, you know, fed off of that. And you can tell right here that the fans are going crazy. It was loud. Look at the players. They're going nuts. Lindsay, who do you have? How about the student section? I was impressed. They turned out, you know, it's easy. This team was 1-4, and four, now they're 1-5. and five. But they came out, as Ed pointed out, first week back on campus. And I thought, you know, they played a role in helping Oregon State, you know, keep it close in the first half. Yeah. Although, I guess you probably don't want to have your punter be your game ball, having that much action out there, <laughs> right? Worth, he's been getting a lot of yeah. Yeah, action yeah. this year. But again, I mean, as, especially as someone who spends time down there, I mean, we talked about the first week of school, people being excited. I mean, is there still that energy around this team, the hope that there's yeah. something turning around? Yeah, I think, you know, for that game, it, was a, I, it felt like an actual Oregon State game. For the first time, shoot, for a long time, uh, it was super loud. Uh, the feasts were, uh, the seats were filled, which was great. The student section was going crazy, um, and the, and the team fed off of that. I mean, they had a phenomenal first half. All right, later in the show, we're checking in with USC head coach Clay Hilton. He'll weigh in on what makes his quarterback so special. And up next, some controversy over a certain Beavers receiver missing in action. What's going on with Isaiah Hodgins? Time now for our standard TV and appliance headlines uh, with our veteran USA Today reporter, Lindsay Schnell. Uh, and I know there was quite a bit of controversy over a certain receiver that did not play last week. Absolutely. You bring a four-star in and Isaiah Hodgins, you expect he's going to play a lot, a lot, a lot. But that was not the case against Washington on Saturday. Hodgins didn't play at all. When asked about it post-game, Gary Anderson gave kind of a weird answer. But talk to Kevin McGiven, offensive coordinator this week, and he explained it all. Um, you know, he, Isaiah was available. We were um, game plan was we were going to be in a lot of 21 personnel. Um, he was the he was the third wide out in the rotation, and so um, we had we had Billy and Seth as the as the starters in that personnel group. So the so the um, the game plan didn't have as many wide receivers involved, just with what we were trying to do, trying to get two backs on the field and things like that. And then you know, we got off the field pretty quickly in in most cases, and so didn't probably didn't get the rotation going the the way we wanted to. But um, he was available. He was the the third guy in that rotation, so we just didn't get to him. Saturday, so. He's not hurt. You expect him to play this week? Yeah, expect Isaiah to be out there this week, absolutely. Okay, so as, as McGiven said, Hodgins not hurt, not in trouble, expected to play this week. I think that's good news for the Beavers, Amanda, because this kid is 
dynamic when he wants to be. Of course, can you imagine him and Seth Collins on the field? That would be good news for them. So, I mean, they really do need to involve him. I know he said, again, a lot of three, you know, just rotating. Well, it sounds like that was the there. plan the entire week. That's what I took away from it is that McGiven said, like, yeah, we knew we were going to do this. So, moving on. Okay, so second, uh, Oregon this State football, depressing. not the only team struggling, right? Yes, I'm sad to report that Oregon State Fall Sports have not won a game, have not won a conference game in anything yet. You see that right here. These are their next chances. Of course, besides football, we've got men's and women's soccer, volleyball. Pac-12 has long been the best volleyball conference in the country. And let's not forget about cross country. Hopefully one of these teams can come away with a win very, very soon. Lift the morale of the athletic <laughs> department. But in the meantime, fall baseball has started, and the baseball team is awesome. That's always so good. That news. can make yeah. people feel better. Okay, and this third one, somebody in USC getting in trouble, right? Yeah, so USC, there's a lot of talk about they had so many injury problems after Washington State, but it turns out they might have also had some legal problems. The LA Times reported that there is a USC player under investigation for an incident that happened at Washington State's post game. Of course, Washington State upsets USC, rushes the field, and there was a player caught on video shoving a Washington State fan down. Now, the LA Times reported that the per player in the video is wearing jersey number 93, which is Liam Jimmins. Hopefully, I pronounced his name right. Not totally <laughs> sure. Uh, Clay Helton was asked about this on the Pac-12 call. He said that the matter had been dealt with internally, and they were going to keep it internal. But interesting to see if he suits up along with all the injuries. Absolutely. All right, Lindsay, thank you. As always, much more to come here on Talking Beavers, including we're going to be crowning who is the best beaver player of all time. We're going to debate that. And Sam Darnold's draft stock dropping considerably after a poor performance against the Cougars. What the Beavers' defense needs to do to disrupt him this week. Nothing short of a national championship. Uh, we really hope to achieve that. I mean, our goal is always to get back to the Pac-12 championship. You know, and, and everything else to take care, of, take care of itself. You know, we got to win every game one at a time. So it's it's it seems you know it's it's going to be hard, but you know it's it's really as simple as you know one game at a time. Tune-up, and we're taking a closer look at USC. Some very high hopes for the Trojans, as you heard in that. Obviously, most of the focus on Sam Darnold. Uh, and interesting to see how, how the Trojans are perceived now after that close loss to Washington State. But um, Darnold really came into the season with, with again, kind of being the front runner for the Heisman, you know, maybe one of the, the top, you know, top picks in the draft. Uh, where do you feel like you, you think about him now when you look at these numbers? Because he is, his, his interceptions He's are now. He's thrown a ton of yeah. interceptions. And I think that, that before the Washington State loss, kind of the, the ruse was up, like the curtain had been pulled back. He did not look good in their other games yeah. either. Um, I think, you know, obviously going off that bowl game, right? I think that's when we, you know, we got to know who he was. And I think expectation levels were very, very high for this kid coming in. USC quarterback. Um, and he's had his struggles, and I think defenses, they've seen enough film to kind of figure him out a little bit. I, I also want to point out, though, that he did in their win over, their overtime win over Texas, like, he looked incredible at their, in their drives at the end of regulation and then in overtimes. So, you know, he had that jump pass at one point. So he has looked, he's given people flashes that mm -hmm. make them think, okay, this kid is for real. And then it's not his fault they lost. on. At well, and, and they had a lot of injuries on the O-line as well, big injuries in that game. So that obviously plays a role. But do you feel like is that is that what you have to do to beat USC, force him into mistakes? What's kind of the blueprint pressure. to, to beat him? I just think a lot of pressure, just kind of, you know, making him a little worried a little bit. He's still young. He's still a Absolutely. young guy. Uh, and so he's going to make a lot of mistakes. And so, yeah, just blitz a lot, you know, kind of, you know, keep him guessing a little bit. Uh, and the team can kind of really do whatever they want when it comes to their offense. You know, I mean, you, when you, you can't really stop the run, but then you have Sam Darnold back there. I mean, what's kind of the balance of how you slow this offense down? Because they do have so many weapons. Well, I think what's hard is that um, if one five-star isn't playing well, you can bring in another one from the bench. <laughs> That's yes. got to be really yes. nice. Yeah. Um, and then it's hard to take a lot away from the, the Washington State game because Washington State's defense is They're really good. different. They're they bring a lot of pressure. He's a uh, Grinch is an it, schemes really interestingly a lot of pac-12 coaches think that he's one of the toughest people to prepare for whereas the oregon state defense is pretty vanilla right now because mm -hmm. they're struggling so much but i'm with ev like and jason said this last week like 
All you got to do is hit a quarterback a few yeah. times and, yeah. and then, uh, rattle his, rattle his confidence. Cows, <laughs> cows, cage or whatever you want to call or it. Or his brain yeah. around. <laughs> also not good. You, not what good. are the things did you notice in that Washington State game? Obviously you mentioned kind of their defense being interesting. Um, but why else do you feel like that team, USC, it, it seemed like they never found their consistency throughout that game. Yeah, I would agree with that. Also, well, USC was just losing guys like one sure. after yeah. another to injury. And yeah. then they're... They just looked disjointed the whole night, I thought. Yeah, they just, and, and guessing too, and Washington State has a great offense, and I think the defense was, I mean, I think they were kind of shocked at how, how awesome actually Washington State's offense is. Yeah, because especially Washington State lost so much receiver-wise, you know, they brought back Luke Falk, but I, I just don't think anyone was like quite where, ready for it, playing late at night, as we've talked about, Washington State's going to throw the ball a million times. Yeah, it's funny because USC always struggles when they come to the Northwest in those late night games. Games. They always struggle. Well, and and one kind of area that they have struggled in, you're, you're looking at it right now, is in the pass defense. You can see, I mean, obviously, it's a little skewed to say, oh, they gave up 340 yards to Washington State. Right. But, you know, again, it's like almost 300 yards to Texas, almost 300 yards to Cal. I mean, do you feel like the Beavers should try to throw it more? Still depend well, on the run? I, mean, I think what's hard about this is if Jake Luton were playing, we'd be having uh, a different discussion that, that because be he yeah. is a downfield yeah. threat. and. Garrettson is not nearly as much, so sh can they try to pass it? Sure, but that doesn't necessarily mean it's going to yeah. work. Yeah, that's not that's not his game. You know, I think, uh, you know, we just stick to the game plan. You know, run the ball effectively. You know, run those you know short routes, uh, and just kind of try to loosen up that defense a little bit. Any any confidence that Garrettson uh, will see a better performance from him against this defense? Well, then against Washington's? Yes. Well, I think that Washington's defense is better than USC's. I don't really think there's a question about that. So you've got that going for you. And I didn't think Gerritsen played bad by any no. means. No. Uh, you know, there there are so many issues right now. You can't yeah. fit it on one it's player. Tough. Sure. Yeah, it's sure. tough to just focus on that one on that one piece. You know, I think we're all trying to look for a complete four quarters, a complete game by Oregon State's offense. That's what we're looking for. All right, more to come here on Talking Beavers. But for now, Evanson is getting you ready for the weekend's game at the OSU Beaver Store. Hey guys, we're here at the OSU Beer Store on campus. We're at the hat wall, and I got my dad hat on. Check this out right here, the gray, the steel gray beaver logo, the OSU logo on the back. Then we have the camo hat, look at that. Can't go wrong with that. You know, OSU fans love the camo look. And then we got the trucker hat. Love it with the washed out gray look, the orange snapback. Get all your gear and more at the OSU Beaver Store. Fan star gear. Still to come on the show, men's and women's basketball starting back up. We're going to catch up with the teams to find out about the expectations for the season. And we're unveiling a very special bracket ranking the best offensive and defensive players in Oregon State history, plus where the wins may come from for the Beavers this season. Now, uh, some of the Beavers' biggest upsets over the years have come against the Trojans. We're taking it back to the mid-2000s for a trip down memory lane. Well, Research Stadium has recently been built up. It's beautiful. They have a record crowd in the house. Their team is surging. They're hoping to catch the Trojans a little flat. Straight back forward. The top throws in zone. Caught! Touchdown! Joe Bush the tight end. Broder will handle it the 30 yard line. Right back up the middle. There he goes. 45 feet field. He's got one man. He's gone. Forget about it. Sammy Strider. have lost their last six Pac-10 games in the months of August and September. They gotta get that changed here today. Went out. Looks left. Takes drive. Fires in the end zone. Almost intercepted. The caught for a touchdown. James Rogers on the carry. That going now. Let's get this thing moving. CJ Gable in the ball game. High throw. Intercepted. Greg Laborn weaves his way toward the end zone, brought down at the two. They give it to Quiz. And the freshman scores. And the Beavers. 
going to shake up the BCS race. And there will be a humongous party in Corvallis tonight. The Beavers spring a trap and shock the college football world. Welcome in Mike Parker from Corvallis. Uh, and Mike, this year, uh, a big point spread, 35-point underdogs for the Beavers. Uh, but watching back at some of those games in the mid-2000s, those were crazy upsets. Any any parallels? What kind of hope are you, uh, are you seeing here with this team? <laughs> well, the 2008 game, Amanda, was a 25. You know, we don't talk too much about point spreads. That was a 25-point spread that night, and the Beavers beat number one USC on that memorable Thursday at Reeser Stadium. And the Beavers have only beaten USC 11 times in their history. I've had the honor of calling four of those wins, 1,000, 6, 8, and 10. I've never had the privilege of calling a win in the Coliseum in Los Angeles where the Beavers have only won two times, 1935 and 1960. It appears to be a pretty tall order this time around too, but that's why you go play the games and, and see, see if the Beavers can pull off what would be probably the biggest upset of all of those that we've talked about. Well, and, it, and I was reading up on, on the history of the series, and it said 1960 was the last time they beat them at USC, and they were known as Oregon State College at that point, so they hadn't even moved to being OSU yet. Yes. Uh, Mike, so looking, obviously, their offense That's, centers yeah. around a great quarterback, Sam Darnold, uh, but he hasn't had quite the season that I think people were expecting him to. Eight interceptions so far this season. That's the same amount he's had last season total. Uh, how do you feel like he's played? Not as well. I agree. The hype has been uh, incredible for Sam. A lot of people felt, felt like he was a Heisman Trophy frontrunner. He might still end up being that guy. A lot of people have talked about him being the number one overall draft pick. But so far, he hasn't quite played to the expectations that I'm sure he had or fans had or the media had. Gary Anderson knows, though, that he, he's looking at a pretty special football player in Sam Darnold. Well, he's a very good athlete, number one. I mean, he can get himself out of trouble. He's a big kid. He's hard to sack. Um, I think his ability to – he can throw all the balls, and he has a, a good quick release that gets out of there. But, you know, he'll throw some really tight balls into the middle of the field and um, where not a lot of guys will spin that ball in there. And I've seen the film that I've seen this year. They're in there. And – He's very confident in his arm. He thinks he can get it there very quickly. He's some very talented kids, and, and he's done that. Um, so he's, he's a very well-rounded quarterback from, uh, from top to bottom, there's no doubt. And you always have to deal with his athleticism also. And he gets out of the pocket, and he's headed to the right, running out of the pocket, just like the kid we just played. Um, you know, those uh, receivers are going to help him out down the field, and his eyes down the field, and his quick release allows him to make some big plays out of the pocket. Well, the thing is, what Gary just talked about, the strength and the brilliance of Sam Darnold, you heard him talk about trying to fit the ball into some tight windows. He can do that. He's supremely confident. He can do it. But he's also tried to force some balls this year to the tune of eight interceptions, three games with two picks, and then an interception in the other games as well. So he's thrown eight. And I'm saying the Beavers have a chance to be a team that can turn him over a couple of times. And flip the field, flip the game, give themselves a shot in this one. And we, we discussed earlier in the show just how well uh, everybody on this panel thought that the defense, the Beavers' defense, played against Washington in that first half. And we've seen a lot of bright spots out of the, the DBs. How do you feel like the Beavers' defense will fare against USC's passing attack? Well, I think USC is, is very good, but I don't think they're as good as Washington. So... I'm saying that the Beavs, even though it's a tough venue, of course, on the road, their 30 minutes against Washington showed enough uh, brightness in the rush, the getting after Jake Browning, who uh, may not be as good athletically as Darnold, but still, the pressure is the key because Darnold will try to force some passes. And I think the Beavs have an opportunity in the defensive backfield to, with David Morris nearly picking one at, against Luke Falk, getting an interception against Jake Browning. I think the Beavs have a chance to get a couple of picks this Saturday. All right, Mike, thanks so much. You're going to be back here later in the show to talk a little basketball with us. Uh, still to come, fans finding hope in the men's and women's basketball programs. We're going to discuss the expectations surrounding both teams' upcoming seasons. And after the break, who are the number one seeds in our damn best Beaver bracket?
Plenty of Oregon State coverage coming your way each and every week during football and basketball seasons. Talking Beavers air 7 p.m. on Wednesdays. And Gary Anderson joins Dusty Harrett and Steve Priest this Thursday at 6 p.m. right before the Blazers tip with Toronto. And we get you ready for Saturday game day with our Go Beavs pregame shows Friday nights at 9 p.m. all on NBC Sports Northwest. In our Comcast business class built for performance this week, we're going to be doing something uh, pretty fun. We're unveiling the damn best bracket. So we're going to be looking for the very best player, football player in Oregon State history. I know you guys have a lot of opinions on this, right? So we're going to start with the offensive side of the bracket. So let's unveil it. Our number one seed is Terry Baker. He's going up against Sean Mannion. Then we have Brandon Cooks against Mike Haas. The two Bolitnikoff winners. Steven Jackson versus Steve Corey. The Rogers brothers versus Ken Simonton. And our first four outs, TJ Hushmanzada, Jonathan Smith, Bill Enyart, and Marcus Wheaton. So I want your overall opinion. <laughs> Is this right, or are we missing something? Okay, people? first of all, I want to say that we decided to put the Rogers brothers together because we could not decide <laughs> who... I, I mean, I think that Quiz was better. I think it's, like, pretty obvious, but I think you can make an argument that if they had never gotten James, they never would have got Quiz. Sure. But since we think of them as yeah. a set package, we I decided we would just I put love them it. together. I thought it was a great idea. You know, I think a lot of people... You know, it's funny because when they, they both have dreads and people always mistake those. Oh, things. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so, so it works. Is anybody missing on this list? So John Didion should probably be on our list. He is a candidate, I believe, for the 2018 College Football Hall of Fame along with Jess Lewis, who will be revealed in a second on our defensive bracket. Um, that's the one person we will totally cop to recency bias, um, and we didn't have as many. We just didn't have enough slots, you know? You know, only, only eight spots. Know. It's hard. Also, for... I think that we might get some pushback that that Derek Anderson should be on our list. So yeah. we put we put Sean Mannion in the top eight because he is still the Pac-12 passing leader all time. And then they're actually one of our camera guys made this huge argument for Jonathan Smith. Yeah. He said he's the, be the best beaver of all time because, you know, the fan base just loved him and everything. So yeah, I think he changes, it changes the program. Fiesta Bowl, I mean, that I think really would change Oregon State's football program. But I think it's worth pointing out that Derek Anderson um, had a good career at Oregon State and obviously has been in the NFL forever. So just I'm surprised Evans stuff. is not lobbying for himself. Oh, right? you know, you know, Evans I did lobbied. for my offensive yes, line. Yes, I thought okay. that was pretty awesome. I think that's awesome. <laughs> All right, let's move over to the defensive side of the bracket, starting with overall number one, Jess Lewis versus Anoki Brechterfield. Oof. Then Bill uh. Swancutt versus Stephen Paya. Then Jordan Poyer versus Ezra Tuallo. And then Nick Barnett versus Reggie Tong. And in our first four outs, we have Mitch Musin, Dennis Weathersby, Craig Hanneman, and Kane Rogers. So what do we think of this group? <sighs> I mean, Jordan Poyer is like my favorite, favorite beaver of all time. <laughs> we already know so it's like, that's who I'm yeah. voting for. I, I, we're missing <laughs> on that list Derek Doggett. Okay. Honestly, one of the baddest linebackers we've ever had. So, this, I mean, it's going to be tough. This uh, is no, tough. yeah, I think the other thing that is worth pointing out that we were trying to get some um, variety with positions. Yes. You know, so that was hard, too. But we are, people should go vote. They should Absolutely. comment on yeah, Facebook. Yeah, this is going to be fun. They can tw tweet at us yep, and tell us excited, we're wrong and we're yum. dumb and all those things. <laughs> it's going to be a good discussion. Which, and speaking of which, so our first matchup of the week, we're going with the offense. Of course, we're going to have another, we're going to have the defensive matchup on Friday, but... Our first matchup, Brenna Cooks versus Mike Haas. Who's going to win this one? Pretty okay. similar numbers. I'm pretty similar they numbers. They both won the Bolitnikoff. That was, you know, huge. Haas won. The, the great thing, the great story about Haas, right, is he was a walk-on. Um, but I don't know, Ev, I mean, who was better in their career? It, it, it's, it's tough because... Um, Brandon actually had Marcus on the other side of the ball to kind of help out a little Great bit. Great point. Um, and, and Mike really didn't have that until, I think, maybe one year with Sammy Strader, but he was a freshman, so it was still kind of trying to figure things out. So that, that's a tough one. And the obstacles that Mike has had to go through wasn't the fastest, wasn't the biggest, um, and it was a walk-on. Um, and so I, it, it's, that's a tough one. I, 
I hate that one right so there. So who are you voting for? I'm going to go with my man Mike Haskell. I play with him. Uh, okay. <laughs> and probably, um, I think, more guys. wins. The Mike next Haskell time that he wins, has to ask Brandon Cooks for money, I'm yeah. like, oh. <laughs> <laughs> no, more dinner. <laughs> <laughs> no way. Uh, <laughs> no I love it. <laughs> That's so Absolutely not. <laughs> Lindsay, okay, who are you voting for? Well, I think that Ev uh, brings up a great point about that Brandon had Wheaton on the other side of him. You know, they were an incredible tandem. That's part mm -hmm. of why Wheaton's on our way out. But, I mean, I love B. Cooks. I think that Oregon State without Brandon Cooks would have lost a lot, a lot, a lot of games. Yeah. Where I think with the what Haas had around him, they probably could have won still. Yeah. All right. Remember, you can vote on our Facebook page. We've got the link uh, right, right here. We'll unveil it. Facebook.com slash NBCSN. Uh, Network. Just hop on our Facebook page and vote. And still ahead, we're taking a look at where the wins are going to come from on the Beavers' schedule for the rest of the year. And men's and women's basketball kicking things off. We'll check in with Trace Tinkle and Scott Rook in just a couple minutes. Back here on Talking Beavers and a look at the men's basketball schedule. Some of the standout games they start Pac-12 play uh, against Colorado on December 29th. And, of course, those Civil War games, January 5th and 27th. Uh, time now for our best foot forward brought to you by the Good Feet Store. And we're taking a closer look at some of the expectations for the men's basketball team this season uh, with Mike Parker joining us from Corvallis again. Thanks for sticking around, Mike. Uh, obviously, some, some things to be excited about. You get Trace Tinkle back, you know, a lot of new pieces. What, what is kind of the general sense around this team uh, about why they might be better this season? You know, the enthusiasm, Amanda, is, is very high. And you mentioned Trace Tinkle. Staying healthy is the key for Trace. A refocused, energetic Drew Eubanks is back and excited about the opportunity to have a huge junior year. Ethan Thompson joins his brother, Stephen. Ethan brings more of a bulldog mentality that I think is contagious to his brother and everybody else. Zach Reichel, the decorated freshman out of Wilsonville, brings a dimension that of toughness and leadership, the ability to hit a big shot, to defend. I think the Beavers have depth at all positions, both in the middle, at the wing. They have several interchangeable parts at guard. The key is to keep all of these uh, players healthy this year. That, of course, disrupted the season in a big way last year. But the energy, the focus at practice in these early days has been palpable. I've enjoyed watching this team play, and I think Beaver Nation will, too. A big year is ahead. All right. Thanks so much, Mike. We'll see you on Friday. And both teams actually starting practice today. Uh, plenty of high hopes for the men's team, as Mike was referencing. We caught up with Trace Tinkle to talk about the chemistry of this team. We got a lot closer, especially in Spain. Um, you know, I think our chemistry is the best it's ever been. Uh, but obviously, you know, we want to, you know, do better than last year. And we kind of put that year behind us. And we think we're capable of, you know, turning the uh, season around and, you know, making complete a 180 turn. Um, you know, we have talent, we have experience, we have a good group of fresh uh, freshmen that can play. In Spain, when you guys actually put your uniforms on, was there anyone that you thought, Holy smokes, this person's improved. Um, no, I mean, it was tough. Uh, in Spain, we, uh, you know, it was pretty equal playing time just because we're still trying to, you know, find uh, roles and, um, you know, just certain rotations. Um, but like I said, everyone was working completely ha uh, harder than they ever have just because they didn't want a year like last year. And so, I mean, I think everyone's going to be very surprised with, you know, how our games have changed. So obviously a difficult season for the men's basketball team last year. One in 17 in conference play. I know Lindsay and I, we endured a lot of long talking <laughs> beaver shows. Uh, but what do you think happens this year? Uh, look, they're poised to be a lot better. Trace being back is huge for them. Ethan Thompson is supposed to be the real deal. Uh, you didn't see this sound, but Trace said that he thought Ja'Cory McLaughlin, who last year set the single season three-point record for the Beavers, is going to be in a much better situation because there will be pressure off him. He won't have to score constantly, which is going to free him up to do more. And then the graduate transfer of Seth Berger from Massachusetts is going to be huge for them. I think that he could start. He wants to be the glue guy, is what he said. And that's huge when you can bring in someone with that experience. But the biggest thing is that everyone needs to put Trace in some sort of bubble and let him walk around campus, <laughs> only if he's protected. Yeah, he's dynamic. And uh, obviously, the last season, it was a tough one for them. Um, going into this season, I think there's a lot of excitement. Obviously, the football program's struggling. So Beaver Nation is really excited about the basketball team. And you brought up Ethan Thompson. 
Uh, what's kind of the vibe around him? I mean, I know you were down well, there here's practice the, this Here's week. the biggest thing is that Ethan is going to push Stevie. You know, a lot of people think that Ethan is better than Stevie Thompson. He's a more prolific scorer. And where Stevie is like an incredible spot-up shooter, Ethan can kind of do everything, create his own shot. Although Stevie grew a lot last year, I thought, because he had to when Trace got hurt. But uh, I asked Trace, you know, okay, so who's better? And he said, oh, I got to give it to my boy Stevie still. <laughs> but I think it'll be good for, for them. And just, you know, it's awesome for their family to be reunited. Yeah. Finally, <laughs> and no one wants the little brother to uh, exactly. Push her on big but I think right? that talk about little brother. Right. <laughs> <laughs> I think that Ethan has a great shot at breaking Jacory's uh, three-point record, so that'll be something to keep an eye on. Now, as for the ladies, a totally different story. They made it to the Sweet 16 last season before falling to Florida State. Plenty of pieces to replace as well, including Sydney Weiss. Here is Scott Ruick on some of the new additions, including Aaliyah Goodwin. When she was a freshman playing here in Gill Coliseum in the state championship game, you know, a freshman point guard turns to her. I was sitting right behind their bench, and she turned to her coach and, and said, we need to run this right now. You know, and I was like, wow. You know, Sid wasn't even doing that for me yet, you know, at, at that stage of her college career. And so I've, I've really valued that. And, and at this level, uh, the mind is maybe the most important aspect to each player. And, and so i um, really happy with what she's brought to this point, and she's an ultimate competitor and a, a true floor leader. You are known for recruiting big kids that can block shots. What do people need to know about Joe? Joe will remind people of Ruth, um, you know, early. Just, just it, size is one aspect, but um, has a, the, a strength that Ruth had, very similar. And so for us, it's going to be how quickly can she learn to defend at that level, you know, and that's what I love teaching. Um, that we know how much that can impact a game on both ends of the floor when you have a player of that stature on the court. So some exciting new players, but obviously they have a lot of production to replace. <laughs> Yeah, you know, it's going to be all about they've had back-to-back All-Americans who hit big shots and big moments, first in Jamie Weisner and then in Sydney Weiss. So who replaces that? I think that Michaela Pivik, who is probably going to be their best bet because I think she's probably their toughest player, their most competitive player. She can create her own shot whenever she wants, but you can't forget about Katie McWilliams. Kat Tudor was brought in specifically to shoot, so it'll be good. I mean, look, they lost a lot, but they also lost a lot the year before, and I have been watching Scott Ruick work miracles since his days at George Fox, so I'm not counting them out. So you feel like the chances of another Pac-12 title are... Why not? not that far I mean, away. look, look. When Scott came to Oregon State, it was the worst job in the country. They had a horrible roster, and they were in every game because he is such a good coach from an X's and O's standpoint. So if the kids can execute, you know, one thing that Scott said is that they're gonna, they're so young they're gonna have to grow. And he told the scout team, you know, you got to kick their butts from day one. We need to get better. And they've got ten players. The other person I'm excited about, Taya, the other person that's on there. They just brought in three recruits. You know, um, Aaliyah, who's a freshman from Oregon, Taya who's a freshman from up in Washington, and then Joe, the big kid who's um, international but played at Juca Ball in Kansas. But Taya, she can shoot from the high post, and good Lord, they needed that last year. <laughs> it, it's, it, you know, looking back or looking from out, the outside, it's really awesome to see how the, the women's, women's basketball team has inspired young girls within the, you know, Beaver Nation. Uh, they're sold out almost all the time it's there's so much excitement around it it's so really it's really neat to see and now it's become a destination for basketball you know Great women's point. basketball you know program people want to come to Corvallis to play for the Beavers and I mean Scott Root has a really special thing going on he's a beaver through and throughout since he was a young kid so it's, it's special they are gonna sign a kid from New Jersey in November in signing day who's like six seven and is a stud so her plus Joe next season that's gonna be a nightmare for teams all right, back to football in just a couple of minutes as we break down the rest of the season for the Beavers. Taking a look at the remaining games on the Beavers' schedule as we continue to work through kind of the most difficult part of their schedule, how many wins do you think this team will get? Well, I'll tell you what, if Justin Herbert's collarbone is still broken during the Civil War, I think that'll be a game. <laughs> um, we've talked from the beginning of the year about it was going to be through this stretch. Are they healthy physically when it finally comes to an end? And then how about mentally? Um, a big thing, you know, going into the Stanford game in a couple weeks will be how beat up are they? So I think it's going to be tough. I, they could maybe win at Arizona, uh, but going on the road and getting a victory is a challenge. So it's... 
In it's not looking yeah, good. In a perfect beaver world, I would say every game, right? <laughs> um, but I think... So <laughs> I think, I think, I honestly, I truly believe, I think we can get Colorado. I think we can get Arizona. That's homecoming, right? Yeah. I think so. Okay. A lot of people, sure. that should be like a crazy Yeah, atmosphere. and that's actually the Giant Kills will be back for that one, so that'll be Do any really of them have neat. any eligibility left? I wish, I wish. <laughs> um, I think we have Arizona down in Tucson. I think Arizona State, who wants to play, right? The Arizona boys don't want to play in the Northwest when it's, you know, the winter time. <laughs> in November. Exactly. Yeah, yeah, very so, cold. Right? So we got that one. And then, obviously, Civil War is always a 50-50, you know? Um, like you said, with Hubert being down, I think we definitely have a chance with that. Um, but yeah, we'll see. I, 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 think there's a, I think there's a shot to win four. And we, wow. talk, we, talked, a little bit. <laughs> we talked a little bit about those uh, upsets in 06 and 08 with Mike Parker. Uh, but Lindsay, like you were saying, it's like they so it's really kind of primed for an upset that time. Yeah, in 2006, you know, you can go back and you can look at the scores and USC was like ripe for an upset when they came to Corvallis. So while it yeah, was an incredible it. win, they were on the brink of losing. In 08, it was shocking because no one knew the X factor that Jaquiz Rogers was going to yeah. be. I don't think any of those things are a play right now. USC is coming in beat up for sure, but they are going to be ticked off about losing and potentially costing themselves a shot at the college football playoff, and I'm worried they might yeah. take that out on the Beavers. And it's been a while since we've won at the college team. Um, it's going to be tough, but I, I will say in 2006, um, we had a bye week before, so we oh, had okay. extra okay. time to prepare for them. Uh, but, yeah, we'll see. We'll see. You never know. All right, well, we'll get you ready for the game Friday night. Go Beavs!